Good evening. Thanks for coming. We're going to get started here. We've got a few announcements from the various organizations involved in this, uh, and then we'll have our guest speaker come up shortly. Uh, thanks for coming. We've got three organizations here, AES, BAS, and ASA. So uh, thanks for uh, everything, and thanks for Alvin for coordinating this for us. Um, my name's Tony Schultz. I'm the chair of the Boston section of the Audio Engineering Society. Um, we meet on the BC campus usually with our meetings. This is a larger room than we usually have, but it's great to have more people than normal. All right, now I'd like to call up uh, Alvin Foster from uh, the BAS, who uh, was actually the one that kind of helped coordinate this, and he'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Okay, I guess I've known Don Keel for a few years, and uh, I think I've told a few of you, I think you're looking at the future loudspeaker over there. It won't replace, of course, the traditional two-way, three-loudspeaker box, but it will be in the home with those who care a lot about sound. Now, who is Don Keel? <clears throat> Don has worked for several companies in the area of loudspeaker, R&B, and measurement technology, including Electro Voice, Klipsch, JBL, Crown, and Harman. He holds three patents on constant directivity loudspeaker horns and has four patents pending and is a fellow of AES and a member of ASA. For 10 years, Don wrote for Audio Magazine as senior editor. That's when it was a good magazine, performing loudspeaker reviews. More recently, he worked for Harman Becker Automotive Associates designing loudspeakers again. Currently, he is semi-retired and heads his own consulting company, DBK Associates and Labs. His passion for the last 10 years has been to promote the use of CBT, transducer loudspeakers. Mr. Keel holds two PS degrees in EE and physics from California State Polytechnic University and MSEE degree from Brigham Young University, where he minored in acoustics. He has presented and published over 35 technical papers on loudspeaker design and measurement methods and other related topics. Among them, the paper for which he won the AES Publication Award, Low Frequency Loudspeaker Assessment by Near Field Sound Pressure Measurement. He is a frequent speaker at AES section meetings and workshops. He has chaired several AES technical paper sessions, and he is a member of the AES, AES Review Board. Mr. Keel is a past member of AES Board of Governors and is past Vice President, Central Region, USA, Canada, of AES. Mr. Keel received the TEF Richard Heiser Award in 2001. In 2002, he received a Scientific and Engineering Academy Award from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science for work he did on cinema, constant directivity loudspeakers. Don Keel has been an ardent advocate and evangelist for the concepts for over 10 years and believes the CBT know-how can vastly improve the sound field uniformity of existing line arrays and conventional loudspeakers. Don will discuss the background and history of the CBT and will describe and discuss the measurement and simulation results of several CBT line array prototypes. He would close with several suggestions for possible CBT-based home construction projects. <coughs> Floyd Too, who most of you know, is an advocate <coughs> of the CBT technology and describes it in his home theater applications in his book, The Acoustics and Psychoacoustics of Loudspeakers and Rooms. CBT stands for Constant Beam with Transducer. It is a term originated by the U.S. military in a series of three unclassified Naval Research Lab ASA papers published in the late 70s and early 80s. These papers describe spherical cap underwater transducers and special frequency independent legionnaire shading that provide extremely uniform broadband coverage without the need for any special or complex signal processing. About two and a half years ago, another aside about Don, is that he adopted long-distance running. Don was always a devotee to exercise and good eating. However, 
Running a Teresa Leaf was not his exercise of choice. Later this month, Don and his wife are taking the ultimate runner's vacation. He and his wife are leaving January 24th for a one-week cruise of the Caribbean where they will run many marathons on five of the Caribbean islands. <laughs> <laughs> many marathons. But anyway, I'll introduce... Don Keel. Thank you, Alvin. I, I came out to the Audio Engineering Society convention in New York and ran across Alvin while I was there. And he, he thought it would be nice for me to come and give a talk here, so that's how we connected up. So he was very kind to invite me out. and uh, I came out, actually came out here on the train and my, my wife is visiting, when my youngest boy are visiting with my oldest daughter and my three little grandboys in Elkhart, Indiana. So I got on the train in Elkhart. It just so happens that between Chicago and New York and Chicago and Boston, that's the main route going across the country there. So I, I got on at uh, midnight on Monday in Elkhart, Indiana, which is north. It's just across the border from Michigan. And then I got here nine o'clock the next night. So, so it's. But you can. One thing you can do when you, when you take the train is you can take your Leatherman on there. You know, with your knives and everything. There's. I mean, what good thing? There, there's no security. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. But you know, you can t you can take your luggage on and put it up behind you, and and there's places where you can. You know, there's AC outlets by, and you can run your cell phone. And, Set your laptop up, so it's it's, it's a nice way to <laughs> nice way to travel. But I have been in the loudspeaker industry for a long time, and uh, one of my first jobs was working for a company called Electra Voice in Buchanan, Michigan, and that was my first in real engineering job. And I worked there from '72 to '76, and one job that I got. In other words, one project which I was given was developing a line of large professional constant directivity horns. Actually, the project had been started before I had gotten there, but had not been put into production. And there were certain technical problems that had to be solved. So I ended up working on those and then subsequently ended up getting EV's patent on these large constant directivity horns. And I have got a picture of some of them here. And then I, in, from EV, I went down and worked for Paul Klipsch in Hope, Arkansas for one year. And he and I didn't get together along. We didn't <laughs> get together too well. I mean, I was, didn't get along together too well. So I only spent one year there. And then I went to, uh, in 77, I joined JBL in Northridge, California, and worked for them from 77 to 84. And one project, of course, I got at JBL was to develop a line of constant directivity horns that competed with my horns that I had done at, at EV. And uh, so I was in the situation of trying to work around my own patent that I had done at Electro Voice. So, I mean, there's always way to, ways of <laughs> you know, changing minor items in the patent. And, uh, so I, they have a line of loudspeaker horns called biradial horns, which I worked on and subsequently got a couple of patents there also. Uh, but one thing, when I went to work for JBL in 77, there were a series of three papers which were published in the Acoustical Society of America describing uh, unclassified military research by the U.S. Navy. And, and it, uh, Alvin described this a little bit to you, but it, it had dealt with underwater transducers in the form of a sphere or a spherical cap made with piezo, uh, you know, it's for underwater use, you know, it's for underwater transmission and reception. And I thought the technology, that, that it looked really neat to me, and I thought it might be a, there might be an application to improve constant directivity horns but it ended up that I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I put the paper aside, and then in the late 1990s, I 
got the idea, well, maybe we can make some loudspeaker arrays based on this, you know, the theory that was in these papers, which is what I've done. And I wrote a series of, I've written since 2000, a series of five AES papers, which I've given, one of which is published, describing these so-called CBT arrays. And I, uh, there are several, I, I'm actually telling you in advance what are the seven of the stuff I'm going to talk about here, that, uh, and I'll get into that, but I uh, approximated this spherical cap with a bunch of small transducers, or, and then, uh, and then the other significant is I applied the theory to so-called line arrays, in this case vertical line arrays, of which these are an example. And they have, an ex they have extremely uniform polar characteristics. I mean, it's really, truly wide band constant directivity. It has a, 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 th a polar pattern, a three-dimensional polar pattern, which is essentially independent of frequency. It stays the same. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an ideal. I mean, obviously, when you listen to a speaker, you don't want it to sound different over on the side than it does in front of it, or up high or down low. And typically, it's, it's very hard to provide a speaker, particularly in a domestic environment like a living room or something, that's so-called wide band constant directivity. They all have polar patterns and coverage patterns which change dramatically with frequency. And it's, it's not only good just to have a uniform pattern where you sit normally, but it's important that it be uniform everywhere else because there might be a you know, a lobe that's facing up at the ceiling or over at the wall, or if you're using this in a sound reinforcement application, you can, if you step to the side, you may, the microphone might be positioned in one of these lobes and it's going to go into feedback. So ideally, you'd like to have the polar pattern to be pretty constant. Now, the other thing I'm going to caution you with, the what I'm going to be telling you and talking about today is... Uh, subject of two patents, of which one of them I have in my name, and then a second patent which was issued, not issued, but applied for in uh, approximately 2005, it has my name on it, and uh, there's an engineer at, at JBL whose name is Doug Button, and he, his, his, his idea that of the so-called ground plane versions of these, where you take a, an array and cut it in half and put it down on the floor, which is what these are. And it takes a, it essentially eliminates any destructive ground bounce. A typical speaker, if you put it in a room like this, there's going to there's a bounce off the floor, and it depends upon how far you away from it, depending on how and it causes interfering dips and peaks in the response. Uh, so these two patents are. I've been I talked to the uh, Harmon's patent attorney, who I was friends with, he works in for a, a, a law firm in Indianapolis, and there is, uh, these two patents are soon to issue, he says. So, you know, so that I have to, you know, I, I'm in the situation here of actually, I might be, re, you know, revealing information or encouraging you to build something that may be patented, which probably is. But, Everything that I'm going to describe to you tonight, I've written about an AES paper, so there's no really no secrets here. So, uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions, and just raise your hand. And it's better to deal with the questions, you know, at the time it comes up. Alvin mentioned that uh, I'm a runner. So any of, any of you do any running? <laughs> Are you? Good for you guys. As, as he said, it, it, I, I just took this up about two and a half years ago. And, uh, and I, mean, I really like it. I mean, I'm really a fanatic about it, just about it. My wife thinks I'm crazy. So it's a <laughs> That's no, nothing new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Last year, I've done 28 competitive events. It's mostly, I belong, in Bloomington, there is a, called the Indiana Running Company, and they have a, uh, 
a marathon training group which trains on mondays and thursdays so i participate in that i'm not an official member but it just allows me a place to do my running and it's primarily on the campus of indiana university which is a big thing in bloomington indiana but i've, I've done a I've done one triathlon. That was interesting. I can't swim very fast, so I was the dead last in the swimming, but I can do pretty good running and bike riding. And I've also done a, there's the, called the One America Building, which is the tallest building in Indianapolis, and they had a 38 floor, 38 floor steps. steps. Yeah, 30, you go and start at the bottom and go up to the top, 38 floors. Well, I got up to the 10th floor and I said, maybe this is not such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I made it in about nine minutes. So it was, whereas the, the young guys were doing it in like three and a half minutes. I mean, and they, they were going so fast and once they got up to the top, they would just flop right down on the floor. I mean, they were just exhausted. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I didn't collapse up there, but it was, I, I made it. <laughs> When I was out in California back in September, I was looking for some races to run, and in the mountains behind San Bernardino is a called Big Bear Lake. And I so there's a couple pictures of me running. I picked up the sign that they normally have on the floor, and you know, half marathon is 13 miles. So if you've never run two and a half hours straight, it's it's quite an experience because you get thoroughly fatigued. <laughs> I mean, absolutely thoroughly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I took I, this. This is Big Bear Lake. It shows the. I mean, we we started over here and ran all the way around the lake. They also had a full marathon and they ran around twice. <laughs> I didn't do that. But I took I took, I actually took the pictures along the way with my iPhone, so I took it a little longer than I took. I did it. Ran it in two hours and. 50 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. So it was pretty. <laughs> <laughs> this is an alternate title for what I'm going to talk about. I mean, broadband constant directivity, it's magic. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's kind of like the holy grail of loudspeakers. You will, do not want your the coverage pattern, the polar pattern of your radiating device to change as a function of frequency. I'm, what I'm going to do now is throw up a series of systems and see if you can guess whether they're broadband constant directivity. Does anybody remember this system? It's the, no, it's the Infinity I IRS Beta. It stands for Infinity Reference System. Not constant. Not constant. Okay, no, it, it, for sure, no. Go to hit in the class, though. Yeah. <laughs> Now there's one. No. I mean, in this, in this situation, of course, as you in the woofer's range, it's you know pretty much omnidirectional, depending upon how high you take the woofer, and then it starts narrowing down. And typically, right at crossover, it'll widen back out again. And then the tweeter itself. Now this has a. It appears to have a. You know, like a waveguide around the tweeter, and you know, in an attempt to make the polar pattern more uniform in the tweeter's range, and probably work pretty good. What is that? What is that? Yamaha. 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 I don't know what. That's not one of the NS. The little. Anybody recognize that? I just got it on the internet. I. Yeah. No fun now, right? But here's just a typical three-way system. This is also a Yamaha. No. <laughs> nope on that one. There's a JBL product with an iPod in it. As far as I know, it has a lot of you know a number of small drivers around the. Just the four. Is it? I don't know. It has four. Okay. Two on each side. Okay. I. It is a nice system though. I mean, it's. <laughs> I mean, I mean, meaning that it's convenient to use and it looks really. <laughs> Has some pizzazz. <laughs> now here's a pro product, a two-way. It appears to be like a two-way 12-inch Yamaha system with a, uh, you know, some kind of a constant directivity horn on the top. I mean, it's sort of in the horns range. 
I mean, if you ideally you can design it so that the the horn's horizontal dispersion sort of matches the woofer at the crossover, you know, so that there's no sudden transition in the polar pattern. There's another. This would be a, a big professional system hung, you know, in an arena or stadium. Nope. Well, that's, that, uh, it, it depends. <laughs> depends upon how they've set it up. I would, I prefer one like that in the total reverse system in Boston. If you were sitting in a certain row and moved your head in forth, you'd get back and forth, you would get a very even roll. Well, it depends. I mean, there are now a, a, a number of the pro manufacturers now have speakers specific for line arrays so that you can put them, you know, stack them up in such a way that so it has a seamless high frequency exit, more or less. So you can do a lot more than you could. And I'm not sure, I don't know what these are. And I'm not trying to pick on these, but now this is just something I found on the internet. Just something sitting out outside some guy's garage. <laughs> it probably is pretty loud if you're standing in front of it. <laughs> nope on that one. I don't know anything about it, of course. Maybe I shouldn't criticize it. But, but now here's one thing. How about a point source? Yes. Well, it, it fits the bill. I mean, it's broadband. Well, I mean, it's its pattern is independent of frequency, all the way up and down. But it's omni. <laughs> you know, and that could either be good or bad, you know, depending upon what you... It has a Q of 1 or a directivity index of 0 dB. It's not directive. It's the same thing in all directions. So there have been a number of home systems that that I've, I'm aware of that, you know, attempt to have an omnidirectional pattern. <clears throat> I mean, one advantage of an omni pattern is, is whatever <clears throat> sound impedances on the wall surfaces has the same spectral content of the direct sound. So that's an advantage of a constant directivity source. There's another one, uh, the Neumann U87, which is a ribbon mic, and it has a, a figure eight pattern. It's not a ribbon. It's a okay. Well, here. Okay. See, I've got experts here. Tell us about it. It's a dual diaphragm condenser. Okay. It's not constant directivity. Okay. Well, that's going to disagree with one of the next next slide here. So, <laughs> if it were a ribbon and it had a, a well-defined figure eight pattern. Well, the size is it's a one inch diameter. It's actually larger than one inch diameter. It's like three centimeters. And, uh, and uh, above about four kilohertz, it loses its directivity yeah, pattern to some frequency. Okay, uh, I see. That's also true of ribbons. Uh, ribbons are only uh, constant directivity in the horizontal plane, typically. Okay, well, that's true. They're, they're the not the constant frequency. What's that? The inverse of a power loudspeaker. Okay, okay, very true. Okay, good point. So I'm, I'm, I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> So that's absolutely no. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, yes. Well, it's, it's mostly yes. Mostly yes. <laughs> okay. Now here, here is a photo, which was taken about five or six years ago, and it's myself and Jim Long. Jim Long is a long-time marketing guy from Electra Voice. He's worked. He would worked for EV when I joined EV in '72, and he's still working for them. I think I think Electric Voice is owned by Bosch now. Yeah. Yeah. So he works. He's 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 semi-retired and works from his home in Baroda, Michigan. But he in his living room, he has two EV HR9040. You know they were called the White Horns because these are the horns that I've worked on and have patents on at Electric Voice. And it has a it's 40 inches wide and about 17 inches high. And uh, it, it has, it's one of the first horns that really did have pretty much uniform polar pattern. And, and uh, in this case, above about 500 hertz. So this, this, this is definitely constant directivity, but not, it's not broadband. When I, when I say, I define a broadband constant directivity radiator as one which would go down to say the vicinity of 150 hertz or thereabouts. 
and in order to make that go down that far, the horn would have to be very large, you know, on the order of six, eight feet or thereabout, which is big. <laughs> Two of them in the, in the living room would be. Yeah, yes, one off. That would be the living room. When this is his living room. And he doesn't, his building room, he has two horn loaded systems down here with two of the HR 9040s on either side. And you sit about six foot in front of these. I mean, it has a, an intense direct sound, no room reflections at all. Just like what you had. Yeah, it is very much so. Yeah, well, that's a good point. <laughs> no? <laughs> and he, he drives, he has, I think, you know, three watt tube amps or something, you know what I mean? Because they're very efficient. I know it's <laughs> so it's it's fun though. <laughs> yeah, or, or, right. One sixty six D. <clears throat> now these are the horns I worked on when I was at JBL, the biradial pro horns. And this is as they existed in nineteen eighty roughly. Uh, an Altic Lansing had their manta ray pro horns, which competed with both the EV's horns and the, the JBL biradials. Cliff Hendrickson was one of the, Mark Urita were the designers on these horns while they were at Altic. Cliff went on to Bose, and of course worked here, now he's retired from Bose, if I'm not mistaken. Anybody here from Bose tonight? Very good. Ex Bose. Ex Bose, okay. <laughs> Somebody back here too. All right. Yeah, again, if, if the horns are big enough. And here's, this is the system that I, my second ground plane CBT prototype, which is right over here on the side. And I have yet another one that I constructed when I was at uh, JBL, Harmon actually. Called one, I call this one the CBT 45 because it's a, a 45 degree arc and this is a roughly a six foot high array composed of 90 tweeters and 34 tunage drivers, which I call the CBT-30. And I essentially worked on these as a, you know, an underground project or a skunk works project. You know, I mean, oftentimes when you're in a corporate environment, you get an idea, you know, you have to sell your idea inside the corporation too. You know, and I, I've been trying to do this and they haven't, with the exception of some pro products, which JBL has now, uh, they haven't taken much advantage of it. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to promote these things. Now today, uh, Marshall Kay is here. Where are you, Marshall? Okay, there he is. Uh, there are, as a result of my papers, which I have given to the AES, they, on their own, essentially absorbed the content of the paper and were building some, basically some DIY projects. In this case, these, these are systems that Monty, Marshall and Monty are brothers. And this is a CBT array that's 120 degrees, which Monty has a world-class home theater system. And he was looking for a distinctive center channel to put in there. <laughs> and this is, this is distinctive, all right. <laughs> and how many tweeters on this, Marshall? 132. 132. Small tang band. Tang band. And so the... It's a three-way. Yeah, it is a three-way. And you can see the row of tweeters up here, and then mids, which are... which What are those drivers? Are the two-inch aura. The two-inch aura. Which, what are these? Those are six-inch parts express with a truncated frame. Okay. I'm sorry, what did you say? Different costs that we talked about, Marshall. Uh, I have to add it up. I could, if you give me a few minutes to think about it, I can give you a number. I don't remember where they called it. Parts Express has a number of drivers that are small and inexpensive. So it's a... And to, can we come visit you? <laughs> <laughs> you go to Austin, my brother will be happy to, to, to demo this with you. Yeah, you know, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that, but a big yes on that one. 
question? Yes. That uh, center panel speaker looks as though it was meant to be placed horizontally. Yeah, it is, absolutely. I, I will, I'm going to go into more detail on that. Okay, because the directivity would be very different. Oh, of course it would be, because it's a line array, and I mean, it, he wanted to have extremely uniform but well-controlled horizontal coverage. And so these are oriented horizontally and not vertically. It's not a horizontal line array rather than a vertical line array. Just wondering how that would, how it would balance in a system that also had vertical line arrays. And his system does. Monty's, Monty's system has basically... It has infinite line arrays on the side. Like floor to ceiling. Floor to ceiling and, uh, and there's, uh, the studs are also infinite line arrays. And everything on the line array plus the dipole. There's a dipole line array. A lot, a lot of layer moving capability there. <laughs> the opening scene of uh, Iron Man will scare you to death. <laughs> What's the purpose of the vertical line array to cover like short and tall people? <laughs> Well, I mean, what I'm going to talk about tonight is this is a better way to do the vertical line arrays, uh, uh, which I'm going to make the case for it. Now, but I'm, I had a discussion with Harmon's patent attorney a couple of weeks ago, and, and, I'm, and of course, I'm, I'm giving information out here, and I'm not encouraging you guys to go out and build these things, although <laughs> you'll have to talk to your own. But they, there are two patents which are pending at this moment, which are going to be... Uh, one of which I, I did, well, actually was applied for back in 2004. And, and then the second one was applied for in 2006. And this, this one specifically describes the ground plane version of this, which is what I have over here. So I'm just cautioning you. I mean, <laughs> uh, The military prior art, there's actually four papers that were published between, uh, well, no, actually three published papers, and one was a technical report. Uh, and the, the most interesting one was, was by Rogers and Van Buren, a new approach to a constant <laughs> beam with transducer, which was in the Journal of the Acoustical Society. And that was 78 July. And there were, there were a couple, another one, and then yet another one in 1983. And this is a copy of the Rogers and Van Buren paper. And as I say, this has a quote. Uh, this is from the introduction, somewhere right in this area. But it, it would therefore be desirable to have a broadband directional transducer whose beam pattern is essentially independent of frequency over its beam, over its bandwidth. With such a constant beam width transducer, CBT, and that's where that came from. There it is right there. And this goes back to uh, 1978 now. The spectral content of the acoustic signal would be independent of bearing. That's kind of formal language for them that the underwater transducer people would use. But at the time I picked up on this, I thought it might help me in designing a constant directivity horn. But it ends up with that I, didn't, I wasn't too successful at that. So I set it aside. And then 10, 15 years later, I picked it up again and thought it might be neat to to design a, something based on loudspeakers. Now I... Yeah, my computer has stopped working here. Sorry. No, it really has. <laughs> Page up and page down keys aren't working either. <coughs> oh, no, it's not even escaping. What's happening here?
Okay. I don't know what I did. <laughs> I just treated my ThinkPad to a 500 gig hard drive, and they upgraded it at the same time to Windows 7. So I'm learning how to make that, so that may have something to do with that. <laughs> Blame it on Microsoft. <laughs> I've written five papers. The most recent one in 2005 with Doug Button where we described the, the ground plane versions of these things. And this is what uh, the original paper that was published in the Acoustical Society of America described the, you know, what's called a spherical cap. When you have a, a sphere with a cap on it, this is a side view, and then a kind of an oblique view, or some angle. And they describe a so-called shading function, which they apply to the surface of the... It actually describes the velocity distribution as a function of angle, and it's at the center of this spherical cap, it's maximum, and then it tapers down as you get off from the center, following the so-called Legendre function, which is one of the orthogonal. And then this is they, they discovered that if you track this Legendre function down to the first zero crossing, it, it looks kind of like a sine x or a sine x over x or a sinc function that oscillates as you go down. That's what a, a Legendre function does the same thing. And they found that if you apply this shading, and this is somewhat, some of you are, of course, experienced with FFTs, and you have windows which are applied, a hand window and a hamming window and, and a Bessel window. It does the same thing. This is, this is kind of a shading that's optimized for sources around an arc or a circle or a surface of a sphere that works the same way. It reduces off-axis lobes. And this is a, these are some of the shading functions specifically for a, uh, actually a 10, 10 degree, 15 degree, and a 20 degree shaded cap. And I, in my first paper, I came up with a, a, a series approximation of that. And I, well, here's, here's the other thing. What, they, what they're claiming is that if you have the velocity distribution on the surface of this spherical cap, if you look at what happens in the far field, the pressure in, well actually the near field and the far field essentially follows the same function. So in as, so they say, and therefore the surface pressure distribution, the near field pressure pattern, and the far field pressure pattern are all essentially the same. And this is their word, this is their wording, i.e. there's no near field which is, I'm meaning a, a near field, the concept of a near field on an acoustic radiator, you get beyond a certain point of a radiator and the polar pattern more or less settles down. But as you get closer to it, there's interferences and it changes when you get up close to it, but this doesn't. And that's Well, in the original, Military, I, I'm not sure exactly, but I mean, it was all done with piezo. I mean, it's under well, these are underwater transducers, and the yeah, yeah, well, I mean, a spherical cap, so it's not, it could, could be a hemisphere. It, it tapers off. Now, I do not know how they actually applied, how they actually got the the amplitude distribution or the amplitude. It decreases as it goes off axis. But I know how I did it in the speakers, of course. You just simply turn them down, you know, by whatever means. Now, I came up with a, uh, just a simple, uh, actually a four-term power series, which approximates the Legendre function, and that's up here. And it shows, uh, this is the shading level as a function of angular and this would be the center of the array, and that's the outside of the array, in both in linear and logarithmic. And it's down, it's down about 6 dB at 
So this is an approximation to the Legendre function. This is easier to implement, which tells you how to apply the shading to the transducer to get these magic qualities. Now this is out of one of those, one of the, the fourth paper, but they were illustrating how the shading changes as a function of angle. It's maximum here, and the length of these vectors tapers off to essentially nothing at the outside. And that illustrates how the, the shading is applied. Now they, they, these are also out of uh, those papers, but they, they talked about uh, several different radiators. Oh, actually, here's the angles down here, 13 degrees, 17, and 25 degrees. And, he, and they plotted the polar patterns as a function of frequency and then did an overlay of them. And it's all very uniform. I mean, it fits in a very tight pattern over a wide range. And of course, it, <coughs> similar to a large constant directivity horn, there is a low frequency limit down to which the beam width is controlled. And as you get down to where the wavelengths are larger than the radiator, it doesn't control anything anymore. So these things all have to be lower, relatively large with respect to wavelength over its whole operating range. Question? Yes? I presume there's also a high frequency limit which is, depends on the spacing. Absolutely, the yes. Yeah, that's, and you, that's when you end up with loudspeakers, that's another thing you always have to, it's roughly that, that frequency where the spacing is a half a wavelength or thereabouts. Now in my, this is basically covered in my first, first paper that I published in 2000, but was a, a, trying to approximate a spherical cap with an array of loudspeakers, a whole bunch of loudspeakers, obviously. <laughs> the smaller, the better. <laughs> when the smaller they are, the more there are. <laughs> and I also, because this, that radiator has a symmetric pattern. It's exactly, it's, it's axially symmetric. So there, I, I, I considered a so-called elliptical toroid, toroidal cap. I mean, you know, a toroid or a donut has two radiuses of curvature. So this, this allows you some, you can have a, this would, as an example, would be a, a radiator that would be a, you know, might be a 90 degrees horizontal and 45 degrees vertical, as an example. And then the, the, more, the, the most, the most interesting one is a, a circular arc line array, which is an example of which is sitting over here. And the, basically what you do is you arrange your speakers around a circular arc and apply this frequency independent laser under shading. And I have some simulations that I'm going to show you where I just, simply took a 100 degree circular arc, and that's about one wavelength, and the height is about one wavelength at one kilohertz. And uh, I simulated both with and without shading. And note that because this is frequency independent, you can often do the shading passively, I mean, through by network manipulations and everything, because it's, I mean, the shading is just simply turning the volume of the speaker up and down, you know, changing the level. And here's an example of that same array without any shading. They're all on at zero dB, top to bottom. And then this is what it looks like with shading. And one, one thing that I'm gonna, I'll talk briefly about is I came up with an approximation of the shading which basically truncates the shading at the minus 12 dB down point, and then furthermore does it in steps. In fact, in this case, it was minus 3 dB steps, so that simplifies it, trying to implement this. And again, these, these arrays on axis is this way, and it's symmetrical up and down. This is an example. This is actually the, the shading schematic from that speaker that I have over here. And there are actually five banks, 
0, minus 3, 6, 9, and 12. And the shading is done, the first three banks are done with a you know, series parallel. This one divides it by 2, which is 6 dB, and this divides it by 3, which is another, you know, about 9.5 dB, which is 3 dB difference. And then this one divides it by 1 fourth, which is minus 12. So there's by 0, minus 3, minus 12. I'm sorry, 0, minus 3, minus 6. And then these were done with resistor attenuation networks. Now this is, this is covered by Harman's, the first patent that may be, may issue here pretty soon, this networking. So they're going to have some patent claims on that. Now this, this describes what I was doing. The full shading actually goes down to zero at the outside edge. This is in dB. But I came up with, you can truncate it at the minus 12 dB down point and then have steps in between. So this shows you the steps. So that, that's just a way of approximating it. It's still best if the shading were continuous and changed with each speaker going off. Um, this is an example of a curved line source without shading. Now these are, this is the so-called beam width. I mean, that's the, the red is the vertical beam width. And the, the blue, which is going across the top, is the horizontal. So, I mean, the, you know, of course, beam width, to you pro sound people, that's the angle, the included angle between the 6 dB down points and the polar pattern. And so, ideally, a beam width that was constant with frequency is, is, is ideal. And also, the, uh, you know, the so called directivity, which describes how the, the energy is radiated. In order for it to be constant, again, this would be a uh, situation where, where this should be a, a nice horizontal line. Now, here's something which is which I call the on-axis loss or the power loss. Anytime you have speakers arranged on an arc from an observer out in the front, the outside drivers are farther away from the observer. And as you go up in frequency, they become, you know, the, the, really the, the contribution from these outside drivers becomes more and more out of phase because it's a curved arc. And so it ends up that the, over the whole range of a curved arc speaker, it roughly rolls off at minus 3 dB per octave. And that's just a result of it being curved. Now, you don't necessarily have to curve it. You can make it straight, in which case it doesn't, the on-axis loss is nothing because you're, you're always on axis. I mean, they're always aimed at you. I don't know if that made any sense, but and now here's when you, as soon as you apply the full Legendre shading, you know, this is without and that's with. It's, I mean, it's a big improvement. I mean, it makes it constant over a very wide range. The beam width, the directivity is also quite constant, and this on axis loss rolls off very well behaved. Well, I mean, I, I deliberately didn't get into that, but I mean, it's a comparison. I mean, directivity or Q or, you know, is important for radio frequency antennas also. It's the gain that you get. I mean, you, you take two sources, an omnidirectional source and the source that you want to evaluate, and you go in a, in a prescribed direction, and you compare the sound pressure that you get from the directional source versus the omnidirectional source. And, I mean, obviously, if you have a directional pattern, I mean, a, a pattern which is directional, you're going to, and you radiate the same amount of energy, it's going to concentrate it more, and it's going to be more in a certain direction. Right. So it's a... Is it simply a function of beam? Yeah, well, no, it's a, it's a function of the, it's a three-dimensional pattern, actually. But it's act, because it's defined in a specific direction, it changes depending on where are you. On axis. Usually it's the on axis because that's the point that has the highest sound pressure, usually. But that, that important point is you compare the directional speaker to the other yes, yes. speaker for equal total radiated power. Yes, that's, the important that's correct. That so is exactly right. Radiated power. So... Directional speaker is going to have
have a higher yes, stock yes. ratio of on access to the army vehicles. Right, that's absolutely true. And you can have a directivity of two, which ends up being a directivity index of three dB. Of course, if it's 10 log. Or if you have a 6 dB gain on axis, that would be a Q of 4, and that's 6 dB. But if it has a radiation pattern, which is the same with frequency, it's pretty much uh, the Q, the directivity, in this case, the, uh, the directivity <laughs> index is over here in dB, and the directivity factor is over here. So this is pretty darn near perfect. So it's. It's surprising how it changes from here to here just by applying this shading. So it's kind of optimum in terms of drivers around an arc. Now there are two, there is a, two versions of the ground plane, I'm sorry, two versions of a line array that you can have. One is a so-called freestanding version, which is symmetrical up and down. Now you can also you have the luxury of basically cutting the bottom half off and lowering it down on a reflective surface. I mean, that's like the, you know, the police cars that used to have the dipole antennas sticking up on the top? And those were all ground plane. It depended upon the, you know, the, the ground plane reinforcement of the top of the police car. <laughs> and therefore, it operates better. You know, it's a, yes. Absolutely. I mean, that would have a 180 degree arc. Yeah. Yeah, no, yes, that, that works as well. That's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, <Gal. laughs> we don't know. <laughs> so here is where you actually cut the bottom off. But this actually, if you think of an array, if you make this height the same as that height, you need notice that the portion of the array that's down here, you've actually doubled the height of the array. And that's real convenient for a home application. I've, on these two systems, the left speaker has a mirror down on the floor. And you can walk over there and look down and see the part of the array that's down below ground level. So it doubles it. So I mean, really, these this is a, that's about a four and a half foot high array. And so the, the, the total array that you're actually listening to is like nine feet. It's a big array. For if you take your real-time analyzer microphone and put it down on the carpet, it suffers a high frequency loss due to the you know the grazing. So it ends up that from a practical standpoint, the carpet doesn't make a whole lot of difference. The carpeting works quite well, or doesn't work. Typically a speaker that you've set on the floor of your living room, there are certain wavelengths and paths where you know you end up with a direct sound and the bounce off the floor. And they may end up in phase or out, you know, in phase or out of phase or in polarity, out of polarity. And it causes a series of comb filtering effects because of that. So in this particular instance, you still, even though I, I don't, this kind of carpet is fairly benign. It's not, it's not too, it doesn't upset the concept of this ground plane. It seems to work well anyways. That's, that's true. Okay. I mean, I mean, you get in talking about reflection coefficients and things like that, and and I would ex expect a, you know, a hard surface covered with a piece of carpet. Its reflection coefficient is fairly high at most frequencies. I mean, it's not absorbing much, right? That's, that's yeah. Especially true that once it gets warm. Yes, I that's. Have, people have one of these carpets at restaurants for noise control. The problem is that people. It might be it might be reflective when it's new, but once you start walking on it for a while, you start patting it. It down. stops absorbing. Yeah. But what I found from a practical from a practical standpoint is basically if you if you listen to these speakers lying down on the floor with your ear near the floor, you're going to have some high frequency loss. But for the most part, it's not it's not too important. If you're listening lying down, you're probably if you're on the floor. Where, who's talking? Oh. Well, 
that's true. Well, that's one thing. When, when I have these playing, go over there and put your head down near the floor. I mean, it doesn't change much. Of course, that's also true of the so-called infinite line. I mean, if you have a straight line that goes from, that sets on the floor and goes up to the ceiling, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference where you're listening to it because you're always essentially on axis. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's the business about imagine the floor being a mirror and the ceiling being a mirror. When you put this array there, you can see it go off to infinity, either both ways. <laughs> but line, true line arrays have problems of their own. I mean, the, they're, if I'm not mistaken, the, um, they're dispersive. I mean, the, the it doesn't preserve wave shapes very well because it. Right, so it's path like the dissonance for all the frequencies. Okay, I'm 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 having difficulty with this. Yes. Well, also. I mean, it's 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 a it's it's not it's not one of those. Uh, it rolls off at three dB per doubling of distance. But, uh, I, but it's not good. It's not like a point source, and it's not like a cylindrical source. It's a no matter what it would be. Yeah, well, not necessarily for an infinite line array, but I know a finite line array. I was going to cover that here. Yeah, I, that's one thing I'm going to... What I did was I have a... I did some simulations of six different line arrays, and, and I'm going to share that with you now. Uh, and I basically, I did a straight line array without shading, and I did a straight line array with shading. In this case, I'd used um, a hand window or hand shading. And uh, I did two curved arc line arrays, a 60 degree circular arc without shading, a circular arc with shading, which is actually a CBT array. And I did a straight line array, but it's delayed. The arc is created by delays in the processing. These are vertical arrays, just like these. So the angle you're looking at is adjusted. Yes, indeed. I mean, these kinds of arrays, assuming that depending upon the, the sources that you use, are essentially omnidirectional horizontal. But the control we're talking about, this is the vertical plane sound field. And I also did, because in uh, pro sound use, they have a, an array, which you might call a J array. Typically, in a big sound reinforcement situation, they put up a straight line array, which has which is very directional. They aim towards the rear of the audience, and then of course the front of the audience doesn't get covered too well, so they put a, a circular arc array underneath it. So you know, so it looks like that. With a, I analyze that also. It ends up that that has somewhat the problems of both the unshaded circular arc and also the problems of a. Now here's. This is just a depiction of those arrays. The, uh, the first one was a straight line, two meter high array, unshaded, and then one that was shaded. Now note, note here the level, it's zero dB in the center, and it tapers off down to the ends. Zero dB minus 1.4617. That follows a so-called hand window or a hand shading. And then I did a, an unshaded circular arc, and a shaded circular arc following this Legendre. This is actually a CBT. It's three, six dB down. So roughly, well, it's actually three dB down out to about this far. So it, it has uh, most of the drivers, like two thirds of the drivers are either on full or three dB down. Now this is one which is curved. It's a straight line array, but curved with del signal delays. This is, very, this is quite complicated because you have to have microsecond accurate delays for each of these little bitty speakers, which means you have to have amplifiers for them all. If you can put them around an arc, it works a lot better, but you don't have to do that. Do you? And the last one is a J array, and this is, happens to be a, a one meter high straight array with a one 
one meter high circular arc down below. And uh, there's a number of conditions. The, all of these, I had the center of the arc at the origin. I'm going to go through this real quick. Now, what I did is plotted the sound field, the vertical field, over a region which is roughly six by six meters high and, <coughs> and deep. Uh, and I did it at one third octave centers. Uh, and I actually equalized all the arrays flat at six meters away. And th this is an example of what you're going to see. On the left is a sound field plot. I hit the wrong button there. <laughs> Now we're going to have to go back. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Pardon me while I recover from my error here. Yeah, there's a button down at the bottom of my remote that turns it on, and that's what I didn't try to hit first. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to switch over to. I've got to move on here. Now what I'm going to show you is that whole series of sound field simulations at one third octave centers going from 50 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. And again, what what you'll notice is that I mean this is a magnitude scale with the yellow hot and you know it goes through red to black. This is essentially up 10 dB and that's down 40 at black. And this is, you can see the actual array over here, you know, where all the point sources are uh, equally illuminated. Now this, this is magnitude and this is phase. So that's a constant phase contour. And as I skip up in frequency, that's one wavelength between here and here. That happens to be 100 hertz. So as you see, as I, as I get up <coughs> higher and higher in frequency, you can see the, 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 the wave shapes basically. Let me, let me go quickly here. Now look at what happens over on this side. You can see the lobes which occur. You see the lobing? No, notice what's happening over here. The, the constant phase waveforms are pretty much straight here, and then they curve around to the side. You kind of expect that. It's not a point source. But as I go up, you can see the frequency up on the top here. But I mean, it's not, it's not very even. Now there's there's spatial aliasing going on here the, the, because there's not enough sample points to show the the phase changing rapidly, but you can see the it's essentially straight in front. But now look look over on this side as I go up and down, and particularly look at the near field. Look look at look at it changing. I mean it's I mean there's a lot of detail in here up close to the array, and that's that's exhibit that's a problem with just straight, being the so-called infinite lines. And then there is a frequency that where the sp spacing of the sources is roughly a half a wavelength, then you start ending up with grading lobes or end fire lobes. See what, see what they look like? <laughs> would, that, would that be different with a continuous source like a 
explain your magnetic works. No, it wouldn't have that at all. It's continuous. <laughs> it wouldn't have that problem. It would still have this, you know, so there. <laughs> so that's not, if you have your, this means that, if I'm not mistaken, this has, it says 100 sources and the sources are spaced at like a half an inch or so. So, so you wouldn't normally operate it up this high because it has a big beam going down and up. <laughs> But you can see it's very, it has a real rich <laughs> pattern. And this is a finite line array. Okay, now I'm going to switch back. Now what I'm going to show you, I have, why is that feeding back? I thought I shut that mic off. <laughs> I've made a composite slideshow that I'm going to show kind of in a movie mode, which shows all six arrays. This is the straight line, no shading, straight line with shading. The lower left is the curved line array, no shading. This is a curved line array That's with shading. That's what I call a CBT. And this is the delay curve straight line array, and this is the J array. Now, this happens to be at one kilohertz, but you can see the patterns. This one is quite well behaved in comparison to that one, but it gets the directivity of a line array continually rises because it gets narrower and narrower as you go up in frequency. But this is a lot more well, the one over here is a lot more well behaved than that one. And this is a curved line array without shading. And these two are the CBT arrays. And it has a well-defined coverage pattern. And this is the J array, which is kind of a combination of a straight line array plus this one hanging below. And I'm going I'm to run this in a movie mode so you can look at it cycle through. <coughs> and these are simulations. You can see the frequency up in that cycling from 50 all the way up to 20 kilohertz. Now this is, this is exactly what I showed you before, complete with the grading lobes, the upper left. Now this is a lot more well behaved and there's no, you don't have those off axis lobes but it, it continually gets narrower and narrower as you go up in frequency. Now this one also doesn't work all that well. This is the curved array, no shading, and it has a lot of lobes, and in particular detail right in the, uh, up near the arc. But now look at these two now. These two are the CBT ones, and as you get up beyond about 500 hertz, they radiate with a well-described angular coverage and the pattern doesn't change hardly at all. You see, it just looks like a, and that's the advantage of this. Now the J-line array, yes? What shading is on those two? <coughs> no, hand weighting, oh, okay. hand window. And that's just like, you know, a cosine squared, one minus the cosine over whatever it is, I've forgotten. This is a much more severe, I mean, it cuts off the outside much quicker than the Legendre shading. So these, these two are so uniform, and all you're doing is putting the drivers around an arc and applying the shading. Now this is done with delays though, so you can actually see it straight.
I, 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 I eliminated one, not eliminated one slide. I was just pointing out that the, the CBT, the, the, these are the, the CBT arrays over on this side. Uh, and I did that. One, one claim that is made of these CBT arrays is the fact that its, its polar pattern is independent of distance. Now, how, how can that be? That's because the, the velocity shading at the surface of the array is essentially equal to what it is in the far field. So in this case, I've, I've illustrated a very high, like a 14 and a half foot array and it, uh, this happens to be a 48 degree arc angle. And its center of curvature is over here, something on the order of 212 inches. And here's a microphone one meter away from the surface of it. And you're rotating this whole contraption around that point right there. And this is where these are so-called polar maps. This is frequency along here. This is angle and then the sound pressure you know, in this yellow hot. So it indicates this is run at 100 meters, 10 meters, and 1 meter. And this essentially, they're all the same essentially, except when you're, uh, when you rotate this thing around, of course, and when you're close, it, it, there's a dramatic difference between the, where the drivers are when it's faced towards the mic and when they're not, so that, that corresponds to the differences down at the bottom. Uh, I'm now going to talk about uh, some of the trade-offs and design aids for these arrays. And uh, I, have a, I have some design nomographs, which I came up with on my own to help me design these. And I'm going to talk about some of my prototypes and some of the drivers that you could possibly use to implement these. And some of in particular, the pro manufacturers have speakers which you can use that could be utilized to form these. And Marshall, who is sitting here in the front, is he read a number of my papers and created a CBT or series of CBT arrays for his church in Raleigh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And he did this pretty much independent of me. I mean, he. <laughs> You know, just from what I taught in my AES papers. And I'm going to show some pictures of that. And also Monty Kay's home theater system, which I showed briefly. <coughs> These are a couple of, of uh, nomographs which show the variation of uh, the height of the system along the bottom axis, the angular coverage, and the low frequency limit down to which the beam width is controlled. And it's the, the formula of the behavior of these things is very much like a big constant directivity horn, i.e. if you want a, a wide angle, high frequency device, it can be small, but if you want a down to a not such a low frequency, or if you have a long throw horn, which you want to control, say a narrow 10 degree down to say 100 hertz, it's going to be gigantic. So this just shows the trade-offs. There's a one particular place here with the design, and then also there's a corresponding one for the ground plane versions of the same thing. And then you can see all the curves shift down. This is this is quite thrifty because you're actually creating half of the array due to the reflection of the floor. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna do it here on the computer. Yes, I thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. Is this technology also be very applicable to microphones? Would there be would there be an advantage in using using it in a microphone? Well, it it potentially could be, but you have the in a microphone you don't necessarily have to have high efficiency because you can do it with gain externally. I mean, so you have, oftentimes in microphone designs, you can get your polar pattern, you know, by putting two sources close together out of polarity to get some kind of a, and it's low frequency response rules off like crazy, but you can equalize it easy. There's a hand over here. Um, John Urkel, microphone book, does cover uh, lines of microphone. 
Okay, that's good. Okay, that's a very good source. Yeah. Okay, good, very good. I haven't looked at his book in quite a while. Now, now passed away, of course. I mean, they're they're so-called in-fire mic. You know, the shotgun microphones can be classified as an in-fire. I mean, you have sources or receptors <laughs> along the line, and you have it aimed at you, not like we do with speakers, but like this. But in, in your in your graph, it has it pointing up or being or shooting up. Uh, oh, okay, that would be the same thing. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. Absolutely, I agree. And yeah. Whether it's a transmitting antenna or a receiving antenna, yes. there's symmetry that's uh, inherent in the mathematics about that. And I would think that that would also apply to yeah. microphone arrays. Absolutely. But the, the, the disadvantage of doing this as a microphone array would be that it would be large. <laughs> I mean, you might end up with a two meter high line array. It would be very, it would be. <laughs> carry it I mean, you can carry it, that's true. <laughs> so that's a. Well, I mean, you would end up with a microphone with an extremely good polar pattern. <laughs> yeah. I thought a lot about the expiration for uh, mic and tuners and offers, but I've never actually implemented it. And lots of people have said, oh, that's a great idea, but nobody said, here, make it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes? Dr. Wesley Stanilak, who makes very large electrostatic speakers, has actually built Okay, but it was a it was a circular arc. Do you think, or what was what was its shape? It's, it's semi-cylinder. You take a section of a cylinder. Uh, okay. It's implemented. I mean, here's a cylinder. You mean take a, it's a vertical section? Okay, but well, somewhat like your speakers over here, actually. The, yeah. In a way. Yeah. Who, who was that? Who did that? Doctor West of Stanley. Parts Express and Matasound are two companies that, I mean, uh, if you're if you're an audiophile, a loudspeaker, do it yourself. Or you, you these are, these are great catalogs to look through. And they have a number of Parts Express, particularly, and also Matasound. And this this is a this is a driver which potentially has some. Application is a two and a quarter, two inch full range basically. But the most important part is, is in quantity, it only costs two dollars. So I've got some samples of this up here that you can come up and look at. And of course, there are small tweeters. Uh, now, with the advent of laptop computers and cell phones, there's a lot of little bitty speakers that you can find there. This is more happens to be one company called Regal Electronics. And these are, so they're so-called micro speakers. And these are, all of these are mostly less than a half inch in diameter. And they're wide band. I mean, you can use them over uh, 600 to 20 kilohertz, say. <laughs> Little bitty guys. And then they have some other ones, which I haven't shown here. They're in the range of a, you know, 12 millimeters up to 25 millimeters, or half an inch up to one inch. I don't, I, don't, I haven't tried any of these, but there's certainly possibilities. Um, in my second AES paper, the third one, I used uh, Harman multimedia drivers. And these, these drivers are two and a quarter inch called the Odyssey 7, and it was used in the original Apple iMac. Remember the iMac that sat down and had two speakers here? That, that was the, the driver that was in it over here. And this this is called the Odyssey 2, and it's used in both, or used to be, in the Toshiba and Dell laptop computers. I mean, basically, it's a, a half-inch inverted dome wideband speaker that you can actually use down to 400 hertz. And I've got a sample of that here. This is, and I built my third 
CBT prototype was built with this as the. I mean, you can do this. This had this is like a a, a, a tweeter subwoofer. <laughs> Apart from Toshiba or Dell, where'd you get, how'd you get them? Well, I mean, Harman Multimedia makes these for those companies, and so I. How did you? I mean, how would you? How would somebody <coughs> get them? How would somebody uh, distribute them? I, I, I don't know what the situation is now. I don't know. You know whether. I mean, they're obviously made over <coughs> China somewhere. You know. And, but again, you know, this is all, you know, potentially patented. Or, or soon to be. But the advantage of this is, is basically it looks like a little half inch tweeter, has good flat response, but you can cross it over like 800 hertz if you want, you know, <laughs> which is unheard of. <laughs> <clears throat> I built a number of prototypes while I was at Harmon, and one of which is this. Uh, let's get down here. This describes all my prototypes. These, these are PowerPoint that I did like posters, and they're all afterwards. If you want to go over here, they're all posted up on the wall. Look over here, so you can go over and, and gaze at them. At, This was the first prototype I built, this one right here, which actually used 18 of these uh, Apple iMac drivers, you know, from roughly 100 hertz on up to, in this case, I think I crossed it over at one kilohertz, and it uses 50 of these little small drivers that I showed you, and this is one meter high. And this would be a, we qualify it as a freestanding CBT. And then the, the second prototype I built was the one that you see over here now. It's a 45 degree arc. And I'm going to go into a little detail later on that. And the third one I built was a, a four standing ground plane using 90 of those little tweeters. A bunch of them, lots of wiring. Um, so you can see some of that here. I also actually built a version using automotive transducers because I was working at Harman Becker at the time. But, uh, I just put this in as a kicker. Do you, any of you remember the Harman Kardon sound sticks? I mean, they're two little clear plastic with four little mini drivers with a, look like a spherical shaped clear plastic with a woofer that's facing down. And that's where I got the idea. I thought it would be neat to, I, I went out and found some clear PVC pipe. And, and that's, why, that's, why that, that's why those look like they look, <laughs> for whatever that's worth. <laughs> Yes. How did you get the two PVC pipes in the stem? How did you do it yourself? That's a problem. I actually called the company that makes this clear. I mean, this is the same stuff as you route your toilet in your house underneath PVC. But this is this this is piping made for the medical industry primarily. It's clear because they want to see what's going through it. You know, I, I talked to the Harvell, Har Harvell, I think, H-O-R-V-E-L company, and they said that, yeah, it would be possible to bend that. Now, these are not bent. These are composed of eight, divided up into eight sections, 45 divided by eight. And they're 45, I'm sorry, eight straight sections. And there are, if I'm not mistaken, there are six drivers per straight section. So it's a, an approximation of an arc. The approximation is pretty good, however. I mean, if you divide a 45-degree arc into eight different sections, the error is not much. Now, this is actually, this, this is, these are the systems you see over here. Now, it's a 45-degree arc. It's a ground plane design. It's about 54 inches high, 1.3 meters. I mean, it's about this high. You can see them over there. And it uses... Uh, one of the Harman companies is AKG, when they manufactured some very fine headphones. And this uses 48 of the AKG, what are called XXL V5 headphone drivers. And I have a sample of that up here too. You can, if you're welcome to come up and take a look at them. 
And it has, it has a you know, fair amount of excursion. And it has a, most importantly, it has 120 hertz resonance. I mean, which is, for a driver this size, that's low. And so this, that, and I used 48 of these. And I thought it would be nice because it doesn't require a crossover. I mean, there's no, other than the shading, that's basically a one-way system. And these are crossed over at 150 hertz to the sub that I near the back wall. I also have some other driver samples up here which you can look at. And this, this has roughly has an operating range down to 100 hertz. But I mean, this is not a rock and roll system. I mean, it still plays adequately loud. And for, I mean, it's surprising how many 40, how, how loud you can, 48 headphone transducers will go. Yeah, eight, 5.625 degree. Yeah, four inch clear PV siphon. And Harvell Plastics is the name of the company that provides that. And that has a, at the 6 dB down point, this, these arrays have a 34 degree vertical beam width on the ground plane, of course, or above the ground plane. It's 34 above, so it would be twice that as below. Below, absolutely, yes. So, I mean, as I say, there are mirrors over there. You can walk over and look at the, you can look down at the ground with the mirror, <laughs> and you can see what you're, you're listening to. I mean, in effect, you've got a room that's twice the height of this room with the array dead set in the center, and you're walking along this, you know, the midpoint of this room that's twice as high. And this controls its coverage down to rod 200 hertz, so it's, it definitely qualifies as a broadband constant directivity radiator. And this is, this is, this is just some line drawings of this one. These are some tests we made on it. I, this happened to be in our lab, and I was running some curves with the microphone actually on the floor over at 10 or 15 degrees off axis. Here's a picture of me standing next to one. Another shot. This is the, I actually showed this again, but it shows the method by which the shading was accomplished. And it's all passive. You know, again, it's uh, stepped and truncated Legendre shading. And again, it's 0, minus 3, minus 6, 9, and 12. And these, are, these are the ones over on this end are done with resistive voltage dividers. If you go over and look at these, there's a little PC board down at the bottom that all the, the drivers connect up to. And you can, if you look on the back, you can see the little service mount resistors. But if you look at, I, I calculated the maximum powers here, is and it's only, you know, in the order of one or two watts, so it doesn't doesn't require a whole lot. Question. Yes. Um, what is the impedance of the drivers, and what was the impedance of the entire system? Okay, I've got those are coming up. the The best thing to do this scheme with is a high Z. These are 48 ohms. High Z. So it it, it it's nice because you can put them in these massively parallel series arrangements and not get the impedance way down. That's, that's an advantage. Now here is the, 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 if you were to turn those down sideways, it shows the levels, it's zero dB out this far, minus three out here. So roughly two thirds of the drivers are within zero to minus three dB. And then it's minus six, nine, and 12 out at the outside end. Now here is the, if you look at that schematic and you plot the voltage drive to each individual speaker, one of which is in each bank, then you get this. And you can see the, they're roughly all, with reference to the first bank, these are roughly all 3 dB down. And then there's variations around the resonant frequencies of the drivers, as you'd expect. But it's not bad. Now this is the most interesting thing at all, and I'd never, if you take a headphone, if you take the specific AKG headphone transducer, and you measure its so-called half-space frequency response like you would a normal speaker, lo and behold, 
the response rises at 3 dB per octave from roughly 200 hertz up to 10 kilohertz. Now, the other question is, if somebody asked me to design a driver to do that, I would have no idea how you'd do that. <laughs> it just so happens that that 3 dB per octave rising response just compensates for the power roll off of the array. Yes? What sort of dashboard is that? Is it just the driver hanging out? Oh, no, no. This was in a... Actually, what I did is I, I took six of these drivers and mounted it in a... That cylindrical, I mean, the, was about this big. Yeah. And I actually measured it with the drivers mounted in the closed box, the same shape as that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, these are just some different. I measured it a quarter of a meter, one meter. And I measured it in the near field because I could get some good low frequency and then made a composite out of it. But when we had the real time going earlier, I mean, it's, it's surprisingly flat. I mean, it doesn't change hardly at all. I mean, with with position, it's just more or less an accident. <laughs> because if you use a normal driver like the ones on the table, this this one specifically, those are all flat in the half space, and you put them here, it exhibits that 3 dB per octave roll off, and you have to equalize that. But this kind of self equalizes. Is that is that so? Good, good question. I think if I'm not, when I originally designed these, I had each one tuned with a duct in the back, and it was tuned to somewhere around 120. But it had an organ, bad, extremely bad organ pipe resonance up around that frequency. And I think when I measured these, that was vented. Uh, so that that's the consequence of the port, not the. Yeah, that's a, a yes. Yeah, no. That's a good point, though. I think that that's where that. I mean, the resonance, the Q was rather high. I mean, you could hear it sing, you know, particularly if you went around the back of the speaker. So I, I just took them out and covered the hole up with duct tape. <laughs> now, here's getting back to your question. This is what the system impedance looks like. And this is with it vented, and I had it tuned to 120. I've since taken that out of there, so it's just a simple peak. So, I mean, in terms of a domestic system, this is very well behaved. Now, this is my third prototype, which... Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Somebody ask a question? No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is the third prototype I constructed called the CBT-30. And it uses, uh, when it's, oh, it's roughly six and a half feet high, 30 degree arc. And it uses 90 Odyssey 2s, the little driver, and uh, uses 34 of the Warrior drivers, which I have a sample of up here. These are all Harman multimedia drivers. And again, this over on the over on this side, it shows the the approximate shading from the floor to the ceiling. And this is crossed over rather low. I mean, physically, this is only about that wide. And I crossed over the tweeters versus these, the mids or whatever you want to call them at, at a box of one kilohertz. So it's omni-horizontal for sure. What order of crossover is that? Uh, I think did this I did process, so it's a, I think it's a 24 dB per octave link with Riley. But I also designed a passive crossover, which was 12 dB. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't end up constructing that. Question? Yes. That in, indeed it is. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't mention anything about that. The, the, there's a peculiarity of these curved arcs that the, the vertical coverage is a function of the horizontal axis angle, and it, it, it does this. But it is constant directivity. In fact, if you want, to, while I have these playing, go over to the side because they all are equi equidistant from an observer on the side. And stand up and listen to it and put your head down the floor. It gets louder as you go down because of this effect. Now, I 
now from a psychoacoustic standpoint what that means or whether it's good or bad i don't know that that's for a listener to determine but again it's a you know it qualifies as a wide band Oh, and this is this are just some other pictures of it with me standing next to it now these uh, there's a lot of drivers and a lot of wiring and we did it with we did it with PC boards and there's a lot of guts in there <laughs> now one thing one interesting thing that we did a set of measurements was comparing this specific speaker versus a, a three-way high-end system, the Rebel Salon. And this is Rebel is one of the Harman companies, and this is a you know this is qualifies as a true high-end speaker, expensive and and it's uh, it's a very good system. It, but in comparison to uh, well, I see it's a four-way. But it represents a conventional speaker, you know, with the driver spread out over the front. Now, what I did was we measured this over both with and without a carpet over a uh, uh, tiled floor. And basically what we did was raise the microphone up from the floor in half meter increments going from the floor up to two meters above the speaker and then measured it at different distances in front of the speaker. And this shows if you're going to listen to this standing directly in front of it, it's not going to do too well because if you're near the tweeter, it's going to be high and heavy. If you, if, you know, if you lower your head down in front of the mid-ranges, it's going to sound very mid-rangey. And this illustrates that. The only curve here that sort of might qualify is the one, the green curve, which is sort of in front of the tweeter. So you wouldn't expect this. Typically, these kinds of speakers, you have to move far enough away so that the output of all the drivers coalesces. And it also shows, here it is at one meter away, and you can see that most of the curves have a, a big dip around two killer. It's not that they get a ground balance. And this is over a perfectly reflective ground plane. Typically, you don't listen to them that way, though. You have carpeting. You know, you try to suppress those. And it gets better as you get farther away. And there's three meters. Here, on the average, at zero, it's not, it doesn't look too bad. But still, you have a lot of you know, rich activity because of the reflections from the ground. Now, conversely, this is, these are this system, the actual measurements on these without EQ. And this is right standing directly in front of the speaker, raising the microphone from the floor up two meters high above. I mean, it's not that bad, exception, with the exception of the two meter one, which is way above. They're not bad. I mean, it doesn't change a whole lot. That's, that's what's significant. And it gets better as you get farther away. And there's no, there's no evidence of any... Uh, floor balance or deleterious or interference from the floor. In fact, indeed, at, at three meters away, it's very good. So you compare that one with that one. <clears throat> so this has a, an extremely uniform coverage. Now, one, one other comparison which you can make is the, you know, the magnitude phase characteristics. And what I did is I put the microphone at one meter high, two meters away, which is roughly on axis of the tweeter in the Rebel Salon, and measured magnitude phase with, with, a, with a wide 100 millisecond time window, which includes the first floor reflection. And uh, this... The CBT45 is essentially a one-way system. I mean, there's just one rate and one driver there, basically, a bunch of the same drivers. So it's a, it's essentially a minimum phase. You know, with the, with the you know the magnitude characteristic is not too bad. 
But over on this side, you, I mean, you end up with ground floor bounce effects, comb filtering, but also look at the phase curve at the same point. It's, I hear I aligned the phase with the arrival at the tweeter. You know, there's, there's several rotations, so it's not a it's not a minimum phase system for sure. Is some of that happening at the crossover frequency? Are they is something the base of the drivers to to get the crossover in phase? I don't know much of the details of the crossover there. Uh, you know, Jim Teal, who just recently died. You know the he had, you know, finely tuned arrays and done with first order crossovers, which he he paid attention to the so-called, uh, you know, the wave shape preservation was very important to him. But with the with the complex crossover where the drivers had a lot of overlap and everything, but so you what? It's what? Rebel has four fold crossovers. Okay. Now this is going off axis horizontally, and I varied the mic position from zero out to 75 at one meter high. And this is what that system looks like at one meter off axis over the ground plane. That's better. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> but my most, what, what the point is on these is, is for the most part, you know, the response that you measure at one point is pretty much the same as where it is everywhere else. So the if you try to equalize it, you're equalizing them all. And so for whatever that's worth. Now here's the, this is rather surprising. If you, this is a loudspeaker array with the center of the array down on the floor level. I mean, on axis is actually grazing the floor on these arrays, they're ground plane. So when you're listening to these, you're listening off axis all the time unless you're laying down on the floor. But the polar pal the, the vertical polar pattern on these is so dead uniform that when you at a you know, you know at an offset listening distance, as you walk near and far from the array, as you as you get closer to the array, you're off axis, and as you walk farther away, you're more on axis. And that compensates for the near far variation of sound pressure. And, and on this, it's if you plot the sound pressure at seated height, which is about 40 inches roughly, you get a series of curves. This is plotting it, plotting a series of measurements at zero meters out to three meters in steps of a half a meter, going from roughly directly in front of the system out to 10 feet at seated height. Now, all these look very uniform, which is great, but there's a variation here and something on the order of, oh, I'd say 12 dB, near far. So it's less loud farther away. Now, but if you listen, if you replot it at standing height, surprisingly, this is a family of curves which is very much the same from directly in front of it to three meters apart. And you can actually hear this. If you're 10 feet from these and you walk up to it, it doesn't get any louder. It's kind of, it's opposite to what you think. <laughs> Why is the sound uh, subwoofer? There's no subwoofer there. Well, I weren't getting back to these. This is a 100 millisecond time window, so it really that is the raw response. I didn't have any. Now these have high passes at 150 hertz, you know, if I play them tonight. So it just didn't go down that far. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what you get. <laughs> now the other thing is, this is a, even up close to this system. Now here's where I'm varying the microphone position from one, two, four, eight inches away at one meter high, which is seated height. And it's extremely uniform right up near the system. Now, Earlier tonight, we got our the real-time analyzer going with the microphone. I mean, you can put it down on the ground and you can raise it up, or you can go within just two or three inches of the front of the radiators, and it's just as flat there as it is farther away. So, I mean, if this is if you wanted to think about it, this would make a perfect near-field monitor because it's very good up close to it. If that's worth anything to you. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
Yeah, right. Yeah, 48 of them. I'm getting close to the end here. So <laughs> There are a number of professional sound systems which you could use to implement these. Uh, and I, I went on the, on the uh, internet to ProSound, I think it's ProSound News, called the ProSound Web, and there are a number of systems, all of which are intended to operate in line arrays that you could use for professional applications. Bunches of them. This is the big thing now, is line arrays and pro applications. This is a new JBL product in their Vertex series. And it's called the, uh, the VT4886. Now physically, this may look like one of those big gigantic concert systems, but it's not very big at all. And here I'm holding one of these boxes. I mean, it's not very big. I mean, it weighs about 40 pounds. So this is not all that big. So this is, JBL has paid close attention to trying to create a seamless high frequency radiator so that you can put these side by side and still have a fairly continuous. I was, I was thinking about some possibilities of doing a ground plane version of this. This thing might cost $50,000, but it would be louder than Kraft. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, it's uh, a... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they have a special cardioid sub. I mean, it's a sub, but by now, I'm sorry. There's, there's several drivers inside these base boxes, and they, and they use them in three, and they have the center ones face to the back, so you can get a cardioid response. You know, to get real, true directivity, down at low frequencies. So here I just thought about making six per side. If you have 48 of those, it wouldn't be a cardio, it would be a cardiac. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> How many what? How many watts of horsepower? 750? It's funny, you think of all the drivers here, but you're really talking about twice that many because there's the ones down below the ground level. <laughs> it's way less than a ton. Well, I don't know how, well, yeah, well, this is heavy. <laughs> That's the still left, I think. Question? Yes. Would you rather have them hanging from the ceiling than on the ground there to avoid? Well, there is, that's, that's something that Floyd Tool talked about as an application of this in a home theater where you took the ground plane unit and put it upside down on the ceiling. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been at outdoor concerts where you sit up and you hear the full frequency, or stand up, you hear the full frequency when you sit down and it's like you turn the treble control down 15 decibels. Okay. Um, well, the advantage of this is it would, it would just turn down the whole range rather than just the treble, so. Yeah. So, but this could be this would be an application of something where you you did not have the luxury of flying up, up above. My, my son works for, he's a, a lead audio tech at Marriott down in Orlando. And he, there's three big Marriott properties down there. And when he does the concerts in the, in the very large, uh, you know, where they have a convention or something, if he can put speakers on the floor, he wants to do that because as soon as you have to hoist them up to the ceiling, you get the unions involved, you know, on the safety issues and everything. So it would be nice if you could set this on the floor and blow people's ears off rather than having to hoist it up in the air, if you wanted to do that. Now here, are, uh, Harman JBL has trademarked the CBT moniker or the, the three-letter designation, whatever you want to call it. And they, what they have trademarked, it's not a registered trademark. There is a chemical company that has a registered trademark of CBT. But in the loudspeaker industry, JBL Harmon has trademarked CBT. And the, where there it stands for <clears throat> constant beamwidth technology. That's what they've chosen to make it, rather than constant beamwidth transducer. 
So it's the same letters. And they have uh, actually three new CBT systems in their lineup, and it's intended for smaller vocal applications. I mean, meaning that the constant directivity is mainly in the vocal range above 800 or 1,000 hertz. And there are three... The 50 LA system has uh, there uh, eight. It's not a, well. There it is, right there. It has eight of these special two-inch high-efficiency, high-power drivers, and the 100 LA has 16 of these. And I think this is about a meter high, if I'm not mistaken. And the the CBT70J is another system in the line, which actually has some smaller tweeters on the front. But these, even though this is straight. This looks like a straight axis one. It's actually a delayed. I mean, the arc is created with delay passively, though. I mean, there. I don't know too much of the details of it, but it's done inside the crossover with <coughs> LC all pass networks or something. And that that's under that's a topic of. You know, that's a patented topic that they've applied a patent for. And again. Uh, I mean, this is these systems, and what I've been talking about is a topic of two pending patents. So, Marshall K is sitting right here in the front, and he uh, founded the, Mallard, the loudspeaker manufacturer called Audio Artistry. And one of the people that he has working for him as a, I guess, as a consultant is Sigrid Lindquist. Yeah, not, not anymore, but he used to be something. Okay, I didn't know that. And he has a number of designs that Singfrid and Marshall worked on, one of which calls, called the Beethoven. Now, this is a current product? Uh, we can still make it. We, we have not been asked to build it recently, but we can still make it. Okay. But Singfrid is very smart, and he, he's, he knows about the constant directivity and everything also, and his systems are... But explain about this system. Is it a... a it's, it's a dipole... Okay, four 12-inch subwoofers, all right. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the panel has two cans and then two eighths and a tweeter. And it's dipole up to 1,450 hertz where it crosses over the receiver and then there's a monopole there. But, okay. But the dipole action doesn't work too well. Uh, turn the lights down in here a little bit. Let's see, where are the lights? I think they're around the corner there. You can see that. Please. These are a little dark. Everything that I've had. Yeah, that's better. I should have done that anyways. <laughs> but these are, are approximately 13 feet high. Yes. <clears throat> and he has three of these in his church in the left, center, right configuration. And here they were hanging them. And apparently, I think this was a couple of years ago when you hung them. Yeah, about two years ago. Two years ago. And they're composed of a series of ribbons. What? That's the Neo 2.0 ribbon. And then the, uh, that little driver, the, the, the truncated driver you see, the truck express carries these days, was actually created for us for this speaker. We, we called them. They didn't have a truncated plane driver. We called them and asked them if they could do that for us. They sent us a couple prototypes. I mean, so to, to eliminate the spaces in between them. the spaces, to try to get uh. that. Yeah. Response. And so uh, we were trying to squeeze that space as tight as possible. And um, so we needed a truncated frame speaker that wasn't too costly, and they were able to do one for us under 20 bucks hmm. to drive it. And, um, and how many of the ribbons are there? There's 22 ribbons in each. 20, uh, okay. And they, from top to bottom, how many of the, 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 the other the direct radio driver are there? Uh, there's 28 in each column. Okay, we paired up. Paired up, right. And okay. we did pair. We want to make sure we have that sound pressure level capability at, at low frequencies. And uh, but with any event, that we might want to do. And how far down do you use them? Uh, we're running them down to about 80 hertz. Okay, so you have subs in there somewhere have, too, then. We have subs of 16, 16 inch sizes. Okay, where are those when you have the it? Subs are in the center uh, in the field boxes. 
I mean, right in the, right next to the the center, the else, the seed. <coughs> Okay, but in the center, but the center one only though. Okay, I see. There's another view of it. Where? Oh, here. Okay. So, who did you say makes those ribbons? The ribbons are there's this one here that appears to be made by Pontan, I think it is. Oh, okay. We we were struggled with this because they were only rated at about 20 watts, and I had great concerns that we would blow them out. And, uh, but so far, the whole thing, yeah, we had a, a this, this, this one, one I <laughs> presume. That's it. We had a Christian rock concert in our church here a few months ago, and they hit 122 dB in the sound chamber. And so, and they didn't blow out, so I think we're going to be okay. Well, one comment that Marshall made to me was the fact that the the, the, the off axis attenuation, I mean, it, it's so uniform vertically and the level just drops like crazy after you get out of the main beam width so that there's hardly any there's not much coverage where the person stands with his microphone in the front and he's and it, it, it fools you because it's really loud not underneath if you know what i mean right it, it, we our our pastor had a great deal of trouble getting used to this in fact because he was used to hearing himself very loud and he used to tell turn it up turn it up i can't People can't hear me, but it was extremely loud out in the auditorium, and on the stage it was it was very low. In fact, it, it's so amazing that in, in, if you walk down the front of the church, <laughs> it says this is the front row over here. The beam extends the top of this chair. When you walk out from underneath that, you can talk comfortably. When you walk back over here, and it's very loud. It's amazing. It, 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 the, the, the technology, this technology, we were slow in trying to get. And the mathematics, the design you do, and then the measurements you make, they match up so nicely. It's just, it's just, <laughs> I'm just you're you're a good JBL salesman here. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, you also made some half height arrays that you use for. That's correct. This is the, this is the assembly. That's the main array right there. We drew, it, we, oh, this is the main array. Okay. We did that. We made it in two parts so we could bolt it together. Because it was too big to manage as, as one unit. So, so it basically it divides in the middle and they're bolted together. But what was the total weight of the total array that you were hoisting up? Each array weighs about 500 pounds. Okay. Well that's how, many, how many of the ribbons do you do? 22. Well, I mean, so this is an example of a pro sound system done with. Not necessarily pro sound speakers, if you know what I mean. And, yeah, so. and cost wise, <coughs> I priced out different arrays to try and get a, a good price for the church I go to. And so we priced out getting um, SLS, JBL, and different arrays. And, and the cost of one array was more than what we did the entire system for, including the amplifiers. Huh. It was about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars to do all three of these arrays. Actually, all six arrays. All the amplification and all the processing. Yeah, without using the prepackaged systems like I was showing up there right. previously. Yeah. Right. Okay. It was expensive with JBL systems. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you have left, right, and center three three speakers there. That's correct. None in none in the room, not here tonight. There's there's one of the smaller arrays hanging. That 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 is a, a monitor array for the stage. The three of those for the stage. Was that half the, the 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 radius, not the radius of curvature, the arc angle? That arc angle, I forget right off the top of my head what it is. I think it's uh, I think it's close to uh, 65 degrees. Okay, so it wasn't too far off of the. It was just a smaller version yeah. or your bigger array. Yeah, I'm trying to make sure I hit the whole. Okay. Whole thing there. This is a side view of his church, but the actual. This is actually a side view. The she supplied an AutoCAD file to me here about a month ago. And this shows the array itself. And it is roughly 11, 11 feet wide with a 77 degree arc angle. And has a nine foot radius of curvature. And this is where it's oriented. And currently, this is the way he has it aimed. 
Where's the monitor array? Yeah, yeah, good question. I don't even know that. It's not shown, but <coughs> there are three of them hanging essentially from this point right here and curving down to here. Just and where are they aimed? They're designed to fit right in here. Okay. Where are they aimed? I mean, here at the... Uh, they're, they're tilted at a pretty steep angle, mm -hmm. and so they, the center of the beam is roughly right here, and then it drops off back this way, and then, and then if you get to the front of the stage, you don't hear that speaker anymore, and if you get, it's about head height, it starts to drop off here. When you're standing up on the back of this ride board. In terms of uh, like, like a choir? Yeah, or anybody. I mean, let's just say you had some, uh, you know, some, I, I know bluegrass guys don't like, some bluegrass guys anyway, don't like uh, 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 contact uh, pickups and stuff right. like that where you can get this real extensive mic and you start feeling like it. Uh, uh, but, but if you have bad, if you have a lot of volume coming back from your house sound, that doesn't work for you. Well, and, and you're saying you don't get a lot of volume coming back from your house sound. Right, we, yeah. we, Back wall is entirely absorptive. We we put a treatment into the back wall so that we. Saying, do you do far field mic'ing? Have you tried we, to do far field mic'ing? Well, we, when we I mean, like of the choir or something. I mean, well, yeah. we mic yeah. individual without <coughs> contact. When we mic the choir, we get more gain with you. Okay, then you do far field mic'ing. Yeah. All right. You can like two mics or something. You can see the stage mics hanging. What's that? You can, in some of the pictures you can see mics hanging over the stage. Uh, those are already in use. The choir's been rearranged now, and so it's in the center, and there's there's mics on stands that go up just above. Oh, I see. There you're talking about them. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's not a mic. That's a, that's a speaker table. Or something. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, go back. The other way. Right over here. Oh. There was some microphones hanging over here. And, and you could, you, again, on those, we get more gain than we do. Which I assume is near Raleigh. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, this is just funny. He, he, Marshall emailed me and was making some comments, and particularly, he says, I'm amazed at how quickly the level drops as you pass by the 60 B down point. Have you seen what church that is in case any of us wants to make an audio pilgrimage? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Cary Church of God. It's a Cary. C A R E Y? C A R Y. Oh, C A R Y. Okay. And you have contemporary services there? Contemporary services. Okay. Now, this was quite interesting. Uh, he pointed out in this email that with this system playing, you could walk out the sanctuary and it didn't sound all that bad on the other side of the door. I'm kind of paraphrasing what you told me. And that's because it's constant directivity, flat energy. <clears throat> now, he, he, he commented that having worked with Siegfried Lenkowitz on, with his dipoles, the out of room test is always one he checks and happy, you know, was happy to find that the balance was amazingly good with these systems. <clears throat> yes? Absolutely, yes. With when the real curve, you're not. Right, so <clears throat> when do you think it becomes advantageous to go to the extra trouble to use the delay rather than the curve? I, th I think that's kind of up in the air. We're just going to have to find out by experimenting with them. I, yes. John, you might want to add, let's talk about <clears throat> why he decided to use the delay on those other um, 
Alvin Foster has some CBT variant speakers, but one of them, which is in the back here, that he needs is a freestanding CBT, the one that's back against the wall. And it looks, looks like it has 11 coaxes in it. And it's actually, it's a straight line CBT with delay creating an arc, except above two or three kilohertz, it's just the center coax operating with its tweeter. So it's a, it's a CBT array, you know, from mid down to low frequencies for the most part. So that's yet another, and that was, we, we didn't get time to listen to these when we were there, we didn't have time to look it up, but he has a pair of these up on his, are those, those are those surround speakers? Yeah. You're using them as surround speakers. Uh, Leslie Wood designed them in J.D. Tanner. Uh, J.D.? J.D. Tanner put them together. Okay, yes. <laughs> so here's an interesting question. If, if you do a straight line array with the time alignment to... Time delay. Time delay um, to, to shade the amplitude, do you get improved vertical off-axis performance? Because now... The thing is looking curved the same, you know. Yes, that alpha, curved, yes, alpha, you're alpha. absolutely right. <laughs> now, whether. Right, it's, it has the same. The horizontal coverage isn't a function of <laughs> position. Speakers that you can steer, what, you know, by programming, if you can steer the arrays that have individual amplifiers and signal processing for each of the drivers in the range right, of the yes. drivers. Um, so I mean, there there are people already setting up configurations. Absolutely, that they yes. Chose, you know, to shoot for this cost of gene width, that could be an advantage. Yes, yeah. Right, same thing. Right. 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 So, uh, most loudspeaker types are rediscovering all of this stuff that their RF guys knew <laughs> 50 years ago. Well, except for RF, you're not trying to get a pattern over three decades. No, 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 that's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> These are truly wide band. <laughs> Um, Monty K is Marshall's younger brother, and he has a, a world-class home theater. And you can go, he has M mfk-projects.com. You can go visit his website. It's real, it's, a, it's, it's neat. He does a lot of really good work on his website. But this is a, his home theater looking towards the screen and away from the screen. And he has these large line arrays that lined up behind these curtains on the side. In this particular situation, he has a, uh, this is the center channel. And now he's switched this over to using a curved arc center channel. And this is the, the top view with, with the screen and everything. And he's. And, and I might point out that the center channel figure that he's currently is based on another paper from Don. <coughs> okay, good point. Yes, and that also works very good. So, I co-authored a paper with Ulrich Orbach from JBL, actually Harmon. Now here he has a design for a 120 degree arc CBT, and it it's interesting because if you look at if you consider where the sound appears to be coming from, that's a problem here because you'd like the sound to appear to come from the center of the speaker. I'm sorry, center of the screen. 
So if you can imagine a 180 degree arc here, and the center of the arc would be exactly in the center of the screen. But that end up basically sticking out a bit too far. And we, he chose a 120 degree arc, which is the actual radius center of curvature is back here. So there's minimal area, I mean, minimal, minimal error, error, you know, from people. Of course, it sounds fine for centrally located listeners, but there's going to be more of an error as you go off, but it's not much. Yes. Yeah, that's one debate that they're having now. He's we had that debate, and uh, partly because of the football pitch habit, we decided to put it below the screen because the beam just skims the top to the head. And it, it, from, from at least on drawing on paper, it looks like it's going to work better. And that's what he's implementing right now. One other comment about this, this point of origin of the sound. Monty came up with a good analogy that I had never thought about. When you walk around that speaker, it's as though the sound follows you. Have you ever seen one of those paintings? <laughs> yeah. You walk around, the eyes follow you. It's like the sound follows you as you walk around it, and it's coming, always coming towards you. So. Yeah. Okay. Good point. And here are some. And this is that the Tang Band tweeter that they bought from Parts Express. Very small. But what's the outside diameter of this? It's pretty small. Three quarters of an inch or something? The outside diameter is about a half inch. Right? Oh, a half inch. Okay. Yeah. You, you didn't bring any of those here, did you? Unfortunately, I, I didn't have any in North Carolina. So, I mean, you can't even see the tweeters are around here. <laughs> Not there, but here. <laughs> what's that? What's the bandwidth of that? I don't know. That tweeter is, uh, we've got a resonance frequency, I think, up around 3K or something. And it's, it's, you know, the only disadvantage, you know, Tank Man is hit and miss sometimes. They, they make some good products. And, and this is a nice product. I wish they would refine it a little bit more. But we found a lot of, um, I guess, consistency problems with them. But, uh, so we would just go manually change them out. We got them all to be roughly the same. But it's a real tweeter, so it's 13 inches times a third. Pardon? It's a real tweeter, so it's not just kind of a wide band. No, it's not a wide band. It's a tweeter. It, 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 probably really useful for doctors and other stuff. And I think it's really softer than doctor sound. So. These are just different yeah. views. Lots of wires, lots of drivers. <laughs> yes? I think some of us listening oriented people are feeling like we're losing our listening capacity now. Let's okay. get started on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Get in there later. Okay, I'm, I'm just about there. There's Monty. There's Marshall. I, I attended a, I, I ran a, the bridge to bridge 12K run on October of 2008 and they had an outside band set up and I was considering what possible applications of ground plane CBTs here. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go, I'm, I'm just going to skip forward here. I'm not going to say much about this. I'm not. But one advantage, this I am going to. If you look at the roll off of, this happens to be a three meter high, 20 degree arc ground plane array with a 15 degree up above ground beam width. And this is the sound pressure roll off as a function of distance. And it's pretty much independent of frequency. So it's essentially follows the three dB per doubling of distance. Uh, and, you know, out to something on the order of uh, 100 feet or thereabouts. So there's two ways of looking at this. You could, uh, for the same sound pressure up on the stage, you can get 20 dB higher level in the back as compared to a point source. Or for the same level at 100 feet, it has 20 dB less sound pressure on stage. So, I mean, they, you can take advantage of that. This is Floyd Toole's book where he has, I'm, I'm getting, I'm very close to the end here. He, these are pages from his book where he was, this is based on the sound fields that I have. In fact, these are, I think are one kilohertz, but 
a point source, a uniform line, uh, a curved line with and without cur a curved line, and then he's plotting the, the directivity, etc. And he's talked about a perfect surround speaker where you put one of these <coughs> upside down up against the ceiling. And it, this is a possible application of that for PA use from real long room. So that's it. <laughs> I'm about to talk loud anyways here. <laughs> okay, John, I'd like to present you with this plaque from the Boston Audio Society. It essentially says, thank you very much for coming to Boston and sharing your ideas with us. And you will get a one-year subscription to the Boston Audio Society newsletter. Oh, wow. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you.